Hello and welcome to this guest webinar about heterogeneous multiprocessing with Android on NXP IMX7. Thanks a lot for joining us. In this webinar, you will learn what heterogeneous multiprocessing means, what kind of interface Linux can offer you, and how to use these interfaces from Android. This webinar is hosted by Toradex and presented to you by our service partner, Kinetics. Kinetics offers software services from BSP to application level. They're focusing on Linux-based operating systems and Android. First of all, I would like to introduce ourselves. Nicola Locloria is the CEO of Kinetics, but he is also deep knowledge on technical side. He is located in the US office and will do the technical part of this webinar. My name is Stefan Eichenberger and I'm a field application engineer at Toradex and I will try to do the moderation of today's webinar. Some organizational stuff. Um, at the end of the presentation, we will do a question and answer session. We appreciate if you enter your question in the chat window on the right side already during the talk. If you have connection problems, you can also send us a message in the chat window we will then try to fix the problem. This webinar is recorded and will be available on our website in around one week. I will start with a short introduction on Toradex text for people who don't know us yet. What is Toradex doing? We are a system on module provider for ARM-based systems. This system on modules can be used in almost every industrial application. We will see some examples later on. One key aspect of Toradex is that we guarantee long-term availability for our products and that we provide BSP updates during the whole life cycle, as well as free BSP support. We are focusing on low to medium volume projects up to 10,000 pieces per year, but of course you can also use them with bigger volumes if you want. Who is Toradex? Toradex was founded in 2003 in Horp, next to Lucerne. We have at the moment more than 2,800 active customers worldwide. We are a fast growing company and have now more than 90 people also around the globe with offices in nine different countries. For services that go behind PSP that Toradex provides us for free. We have more than 45 brewing partners like Kinetics who pre presents us this webinar today. Um, our headquarter is as I already said in Horb Luzern but we as you can see we, we are spread all over the world and we have offices in almost all continents. What makes us special is also that we have in-house hardware and software development so we can guarantee that everything works right out of the box. We don't have any distributors. We sell our products di directly to our customers. That's about our spreading over the world. So as I already said, applications that we find our products, we have communication, robotics, industrial and automation, and also medical and healthcare, for example. All three of, of these fields are could really profit from this webinar because I think AMP is, is something that's interesting for them. For example, if you, you think about medical and healthcare, where you can run a real-time operating system on the Cortex-M4, um, and you don't have to certificate that Cortex-M4 software all the time again, and you can run your non-critical stuff like GUI and so on on the Cortex-A7. Of course, you can also use products on, the, on other applications like marine defense and so on. What are our product lines? We have two product, line, product lines. We started with the Colibri module. The Colibri module has a lot of industrial of, or useful industrial uh, buses like SPI, CAN, I2C and so on. Uh, but it lacks of high-speed interfaces like 
PCI Express, USB 3, and other high-speed buses. And therefore, we, we introduced the Palis modules. These uh, Palis modules um, are newer, but they are not meant to, to, to replace the Colibri modules. So if you want cheap and um, smaller devices, you can use the Colibri modules. And as soon as you want high-speed and high performance modules, you can choose the Palis module. So, okay, then I would like to hand over now to Nicola from Kinetics, and he will do the technical part of this, this webinar. Thanks everyone for attending this session, and um, we will be talking about uh, heterogeneous multiprocessing uh, with Android and uh, on IM, NXP NX7. There are plenty of uh, Toradex webinar on asymmetric multiprocessing. And so there are tons of references that you guys can uh, absolutely um, check if you want a more detail on asymmetric multiprocessing on Linux. Uh, we are actually talking about Linux. We are talking about uh, low level stuff, but uh, we will be focusing on what we have done so far on the uh, Android side. Mm -hmm. Uh, a little bit about Kinetics. Uh, we are a full software stack engineering firm. We have two units, one embedded that primarily OSs and uh, low level bare metal software skills, and one application unit that is more on the uh, application layer. We use different kind of framework, um, basically Java. We are um, almost oriented to Java and polyglot JVM based languages. But we also obviously support native, native languages like C and C++ and the Golang. Uh, we are very focused on NXP and embedded application processors. And uh, uh, we are particularly focused on porting Android OS for different industries, for different embedded custom platforms. We do current development on the Android side. We do also uh, API device integration. So when customers want to integrate their custom sensors to the Android system, uh, we provide integration with the abstraction layer. And also we uh, develop custom services, native or Java, to allow uh, custom services to deal with custom hardware if necessary. Uh, one of the things that, one of the best practices that we include in our uh, life cycle of, uh, you know, software life cycle is the continuous this and delivery. Uh, so we apply all of those best practices in order for compiling OS in a way that is predictive and deterministic. So we will be talking about different things, but first of all, we will be just do an introduction on uh, what is um, asymmetric multi-core development and architecture um, and the differences between asymmetric and symmetric. Uh, then we will do an overview of the IMX7 and the OpenARM framework. Then we will switch to what we have done so far uh, on the Android kernel when we uh, ported the RP message framework in order to uh, handle the asymmetric multiprocessing. And then we have condensed all these development in what we call the Coesis DSP, that is like an Android DSP with all the artifacts that are necessary to support asymmetric multiprocessing. We have a demo, obviously. We will show you a headless demo. Uh, that means that he has been developed using the native NDK of Android. And we will also see a headful demo that uh, leverage the uh, the, the Android GUI and so all the Java Android SDK to read data from the sensor and display data on the screen. So let's start briefly about differences between uh, symmetric and um, asymmetric uh, multiprocessing. In particular, we know that um, we need more uh, computational power, and the symmetric multiprocessing has been introduced since kernel 2.0. And initially, there were other techniques to make software, uh, you know, like scalable in terms of uh, computational power, using, for example, loosely uh, coupled microprocessing systems. So you have like standalone 
uh, processing units and those processing units were connected some high-speed bus but actually it was not really simple to do that so um, when we have a multi-core processor and we want to leverage all these cores the kernel can actually do a lot of stuff for us and uh, basically in symmetric multiprocessing this is a single OS that manages two or more identical uh, processing units and uh, all these kind of uh, parallelism is abstracted to the developer that from his side, core side, uh, doesn't see any particular challenge and the software runs like smoothly because the OS actually distributes all the computational power between the core. On the asymmetric multiprocessing stuff is a little bit different. We have the actually different cores that can run different OSs. And those cores can run OSs that are different architectures as well. So one typical example that we want to run a rich operating system on one core, like Android, and we want to uh, run a microphone folder, uh, like FreeRTOS, on another core. So two completely different operating systems. Uh, to do that, we need some kind of um, library, right? Uh, what we call the multi-core communication API. And these are a sort of specifications that makes the communication between the different cores and different architectures to happen. So there are different flavors for uh, multi-core communication API. OpenAMP is one of those, and this is what we will be using. And it's important to understand that there are really good use cases for implementing uh, asymmetric multiprocessing in different scenarios, uh, different products. I guess that automotive is a really good example. So, you know, there are infotainment system has to be decoupled by critical system, other components in the system for security and, you know, and responsiveness. Uh, another example is like uh, drones. Uh, drones, you want a segregation between all the camera system and all the high level functionalities uh, with respect to the attitude and determination console system to have, for example, a back home function in case there is a failure on the system. You want to be able to take your drone back all the time. So the, 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 all the motors and all the attitude control systems should be handled in a real time environment. Medical devices is a really a, a good example too. Uh, where, for example, you want a separation between uh, very critical uh, sensors and, again, a rich UI that may run an, another operating system like Android or Linux. So, and you want to really separate the two different, uh, the two different domains. So, why we want a heterogeneous system? Well, um, we want basically concurrent execution in some segregated environment. This is probably, the, for me, the best reason why I want to play with those, with those systems. By the way, the segregation can be reached in different manners. The, the first was probably, is a little bit old-fashioned, but is, it has been used quite a lot. It's, it's called the multi-chip approach. Multi-chip approach means that um, those systems are loosely coupled. So we have two different chips. We have a microcontroller and a microprocessor. Obviously, this is not really um, a sweet spot, especially for bond costs. So you have in two systems and you have also um, the power management. So there is a lot of issues that you may encounter uh, designing a system that has multi-chip support. Another approach for segregation is absolutely use virtualization. That is absolutely, today is really common, especially with the MX8 that is really close to production today as um, for many products. And it's good, uh, it's good having like visualization, but you know, you may have performance impact, uh, real-time impact, power impact, so there is a drawback of using visualization, even if it is really sweet. So the, um, instead the heterogeneous multiprocessing that we're talking today is what today is very efficient for either process communication, and uh, you know, you use one chip, so one silicon, and um, obviously you have some drawbacks that uh, to share resources and require isolation and protection mechanisms. Those things have to be designed in the proper way. So the microprocessor that we, we use today to, for the demo 
and for uh, that we have been using in the past for asymmetric processing projects is the um, NXP IMX7. So the IMX7 um, for our purposes has two cores. Uh, uh, well, actually, yes, two cores, but we are using uh, the Cortex A7 as the master core and uh, the Cortex M4 uh, as um, the remote core, that we call the remote core. Uh, all, you know, there's plenty of documentation if someone wants to get more closer to the NXP IMX7 specs, so you can actually go and um, find a lot of documentations in such regard. Uh, one of the things that is really important is that the two cores, they communicate in hardware uh, by a component called the messaging unit. So the messaging unit is the, the skeleton on top of what everything we'll be talking is based upon. So the messaging unit is composed by a set of registers and interrupts that allow messages to be exchanged between the two cores. In software, right, we will be using the RP message uh, framework from, uh, sorry, the RP message component from the Open AMP framework that takes care about exchanging messaging between, uh, messages between the two, the two cores. Uh, in case the two cores uh, shares the same peripherals, there is also what is called the resource domain controller that takes care about uh, avoiding conflicts in those sharing uh, situation. So another very good question is why embedded Android? And uh, there are probably different kind of uh, philosophies here. Uh, but I guess that Android became really popular in the embedded world uh, because it's very application oriented. There is a very good abstraction between the low-level hardware and the what, what is the application layer. You can build really rich UI, both the native, you know, we have example of gaming systems that are using uh, OpenGL, um, and uh, also you, you can leverage the SDK, obviously, the Java SDK. Um, you have good debug, great debugging tools, actually, and a very, pro a very productive development environment like Android Studio. So the, the last statement, it can be a little bit, you know, uh, strong, but one of the reasons Android was really popular is that any Java that, in the embedded, I'm saying in the embedded ecosystem, is that any Java developer can be an application developer, application developer, so not a kernel developer. Um, and this is one of the reasons why, I guess, Google reintroduced the Java runtime environment in Android of Things when they tried to get rid of the Java runtime environment in the project Brillo that was totally oriented to the NDK. So you probably lose a lot of developers, you know, if you drop Java in, in, in the Android ecosystem. So I guess that this is one of the most uh, compelling reasons why Android has been used so far in, in embedded systems. So the OpenAMP framework, so let's, let's talk about more about the OpenAMP framework. And um, so there are basically three layers. And uh, I don't want to be very detailed, but I want to give you some information about this. So three layers are uh, the physical layer, that is basically the share memory and the, the interrupts that are um, that each that the master core actually sends to the remote core. Then we have the VTIO system that is an existing subsystem very used in virtualization. And VTIO and, and, and in, in, in particular the virtual queue are what is called the uh, media access layer. And, uh, at the, and on top of the media access layer, there is the transport layer that is the RP message framework, right, to actually handle messages between the two, the two cores. I'm talking about two cores right now because we're talking about the IMX7, obviously. So really, I want to be not really uh, to talk, talking too much about the uh, the, the VTIO um, layer, 
but it's quite important to understand that all everything develops around um, a concept of virtual queue. So uh, each RP message channel contains two virtual queues associated with a transmission virtual queue and a receiving virtual queue. So when I wanted to transmit something from the master to the remote, I would be using one virtual queue. And when I receive something from the remote to the master, I'm using another uh, virtual queue. So virtual queue is based on a, a buffer component called the V-ring. And V-ring is all, you know, basically three things a descriptor that actually address the buffer in memory, and two ring buffers, um, one that is actually is a, a single writer, single reader circular buffering. So uh, the, one buffer would be just for um, writing, and one buffer would be just for reading. And, and specifically, the avail buffer would be for writing, and the uh, V-ring used would be for reading. So this is a typical example of how master and, and, and remote, they, uh, they exchange uh, uh, a message. So the master get, um, use the get buffer function. So if you see here, uh, we have a two uh, function, add buff and get buff. So the master will get a buffer from a virtual queue, number one, right? Because we have, let's say that we are uh, transmitted something to the remote and we get the index from uh, the used ring. Uh, this ring is available for to be filled with some, some contents. So the master will fill the buffer and add buffer to the virtual queue in the available uh, ring buffer and updating the ID. The remote core, we use get buffer from the available ring and uh, when it consumes the buffer, it will add the buffer to the used ring when the buffer has been free and is ready to be used again by the master for another message. And so the loop actually continues. Uh, when we go from the, when the master receives something from the core, from the remote core, uh, the situation is switched, but we have to be very careful that the master is always the, 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 uh, is always freeing the buffer before it's filled by the remote. So basically, the master always decues something from the used ring, the, re the used ring buffer, and enqueues something on the available ring buffer. And um, on the other side, uh, the remote always decues from the available buffer ring and enqueues always on the user buffer ring. So, um, Every remote core, so here we have an example. So we have one master core and two remote cores. So it's not the case of the uh, IMX7, but you know, it's just for, as, as a good example, how the, the framework actually works. So every remote core is represented by our RP message device. And um, we have a communicate. Actually the um, RP message device provide what is called the communication channel between a master and the remote. So we have one communication channel between a master and one remote. If we have two remote, we have two communication channels. On top of the uh, channel, we have what is called the endpoint. And the endpoint is what is used by applications to extract data that are coming from remote to the master or master remote vice versa. So it's the endpoints it is what our application will be using. Uh, at the end. Um, so in this situation, we have two remotes, one master, and we have three endpoints for the remote number two, and one um, endpoint for the remotes, uh, the P3. And obviously, we have four endpoints uh, or that the master application on the master processor has two. We will see what are those endpoints. It's really important. Endpoints at the end, they are a character device. Basically, character device is slash dev. So the driver, the RP message driver is what makes the magic. And there are two components. 
what we call the console interface that allows the creation of endpoints using an IOCTL, uh, IO control uh, call. And then we have the end of endpoint interface that is just um, you know, a, a character device that the application can open, read, and write on top of. So it's really like writing on a device as, as any other device in slash that. So the driver, the RP manager's product driver has been introduced in the Linux kernel for uh, 0.11. And uh, we did some back port actually to the, to the kernel 4.9 that we are using in, 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 this, in this demo. We will give you, I will give you some reference uh, at the end of the, of the talk about where to find some, some, some documentation and, and resources. So this is a very important picture. Uh, so everything starts from the platform bus. So we have three buses, basically. We have the platform bus, that is the low level hardware, really close to the hardware. Then we have the VTIO bus, that is provided by the VTIO uh, kernel, uh, kernel drivers and modules. Uh, and then we have the RP message bus. And all these three buses has to be connected together. So first of all, we have a platform driver that um, registers on the platform bus and create a new VTIO device that is not present in VTIO. Usually that is the RP message VTIO device. So we have to add something to the VTIO bus. It's, it's really like other devices that you can add to the VTIO bus, like uh, block devices, like hard disks, but this is a special one. So we need a driver for, to create this new VTIO device on the VTIO bus. Then we need another piece that is the VTIO RP message driver that registers on the VTIO bus and uh, actually goes up to the RP message bus re and, and registers a new device that is called the RP message device. So the RP message device is the core of everything. Uh, obviously the RP message bus is created by another driver uh, that here is um, shown as uh, RP message underscore core. Uh, so that bus actually has to be created. Uh, on top of the RP message bus, we see uh, the, the character driver. So this is what creates the uh, control uh, interface. That is the console zero that you see between the user space and the kernel space. And using an IO control call, I finally created that RP message zero character device that my application will open to write and read data. So it seems to be a little bit complex, but it's a kind of chain that makes sense once you, you know, you get used to. So uh, let's jump a little bit on what we are uh, showing here. Uh, so we need a lot of things to be uh, integrated in a BSP, Android BSP, in order to um, you know, use the asymmetric architecture. And so we need a, like an Android to start from, and we choose the Android 7.1.2. Then we need a U-boot that support also the ELF files, because ELF files is what uh, the microcontroller, the MCU, will be using and, and loading, uh, containing the uh, obviously the uh, RTOS, uh, the, um, the operating systems, and the software on top of the operating system. Um, and then we need also a kernel, obviously, that supports the RP message framework. And uh, so what we did is to take the uh, the driver from the kernel 4.11 and back port to the kernel 4.9 that is the kernel that is supported in Android 7.1.2 by NXP. Uh, so uh, we did this build compatible with the uh, Colibri uh, IMX7 uh, SOC with one gigabyte of RAM. We use the Toradex Iris schedule board and we use the off-the-shelf seven inches capacity parallel display from Toradex as well. So the demo is basically to show how we can gather data 
from my IMU sensor attached physically to the E2C bus, and the E2B, E2, E2C bus um, uh, is uh, accessed by, uh, exclusively by, by the MCU, and uh, the, the data, uh, the data are, are collected by the MCU and sent to the master core, where Android is running, uh, and where we have a headless mode, so a headless demo, where we are just using a C, uh, um, a C program that open, close, read data from the character device, the RP message character device, and show uh, data on the screen and logs on a file, right? This is a very good uh, ramping up. Uh, technique to just understand the mechanism and then we are ready to develop an Android app running uh, with a full UI right where we plot uh, the, the, the actual data the actual data coming from the um, from the NCU um, th there was a there was a, an interesting um, uh, use case that we developed. So the first was um, we want to receive data on the on the master core right? Um, in, in, in a vector format. So we want to receive all the components. So we are using an IMU, right, that is, is a nine degree IMU. So it's providing three components for the acceleration, three components for the gyroscope, and uh, three components for the magnetometer. And uh, so we want to display all these data, raw data, and we call that, that mode vector mode. And then we may want to display some more structured data. Let's say that we want to calculate the module, the norm. I don't know how you call that. Is the absolute what we call the absolute value of a vector? That means the square root of the square of the uh, the sum of the square of the three components of each vector. This is a it's a good use case because. It, it, it shows how this is a simple example, but some math can be done inside the NSU. So some processing, some 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 filtering, some processing, some uh, some edge computation can be done on the MCU side without sending tons of data to the uh, master core and do some filtering over there. So we can do computation effectively on the on the MCU. So this is the setup that we have been using, so the Toradex Iris um, uh, carrier board. Uh, we are using the Colibri IMX7 sum module. Um, we are using the NXP um, FXOS uh, 8700. It's a very, I like the, a lot this sensor. I've been using this sensor for quite for a long time. And, and other fruit actually, other fruit uh, did a breakout board to uh, the, the, the features uh, the FXOS and also as a gyroscope the FXA S2. So these are very high precision sensors. So this is you know I've been using those for for a while. And uh, by the way now they are out of stock. I hope they will be back um, uh, manufacturing this 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 piece of hardware because it's really sweet. I, I like really I like really much. So this is the architecture of the demo. Uh, so we have the two cores. The, the, the remote core is on the uh, right and the master core is on the left. So we have uh, uh, Android running on the master core, we have the kernel space and the user space, and uh, we have the MCU core running basically two tasks, and those tasks exchange data using a buffer queue, that is the symbol that you see between the two, the two tasks. Uh, the two cores uh, communicate with uh, one RT message channel because there is one core and one remote, and we have just one endpoint on top of the RT message channel. So let's see what happens in detail. So in the uh, in the FreeRTOS, we have developed an application that is running on top of FreeRTOS, and this application is made by two different tasks. And um, so the two tasks are one is pulling the EMU and gather the data, and we want to gather the data and do some filtering depending if we are on norm mode or in raw mode. So if we are in norm mode, we want to compute the, um, the module of the vector. If we are in raw mode, we can do anything. Again, this is a really good example how to do some math on the NCU side.
And then when the, um, the, 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 the data are gathered, we just send, we, we, we enqueue the data on the buffer and the data center task grab the data from the uh, from the queue and uh, takes care of sending those data to the master core. Here we have two intercore signaling um, general purpose interrupts. They are really important because they allow the, the master core to start and stop the process of gathering data from the remote core. There is also a third one that we call the heartbeat the heartbeat is just a heartbeat, and uh, if we wanted to detect, in exam for example, that the master core crashed because of kernel panic, right? We can notify the, the sorry, the remote core is notified about the, that crash. Uh, we did a demo at the Linux Embedded Conference where we simulated um, a, a crash, you know, like a. Um, we simulated um, kernel crash, uh, and uh, because the master core is what is providing power, we couldn't actually turn off the the master core. So we wanted the master core to just reboot. Meanwhile, the uh, MCU was continue was continuing to work. So to work, it was gathering data in the meantime that the master core was rebooting. So this is why we implemented also the heartbeat. Uh, interrupt signals. On the uh, Android side, we have uh, two components. One is in the kernel, that is the RP message tar uh, card driver, or chart driver, card driver, I don't know how you guys say it. Uh, but the character device is divided in two. One is the control device, and the other is the RP message actual character device that is used by, um, by the application to, to gather the data. Uh, also, the console device is used by the application just because I'm using the console device, the underscore console zero, to trigger the creation of the endpoint using an IO control uh, function. Like I, I have an example of that, so you, you, will see, you will see that. So this is the first demo I want to show you. So so. We have two cores, so on the left side we had the Android booting and on the uh, right side we had the, uh, the M4 and uh, they were connected just by using console, by using a console. So we see what's the, you know, what's the status of each component of the system. So the Android uh, booted and now what, we, what you see here, a host PC console and we are pushing the binary uh, of the uh, first headless demo that is just a um, NDK compiled uh, program with all the necessary uh, code to actually read data from the master from the remote core. So here we are pushing the binary, right? Um, we, okay, we are switching to a root to, 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 to root and ready to uh, shell into the Android device. So here we are in the Colibri, in the Colibri shell, and we go to the directory where the binary is, and we will be launching the binary. So here we are launching actually the binary. Uh, we launch in norm mode. So here we do um, uh, what we do is to select which kind of operation we want to carry. And the first one is, okay, give me the, all the data with the module of the tree, of, of the tree, of the tree vectors. So what is happening now, the, 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 the program create the endpoints, and now the, the, the core, the, the remote core is sending data. So we create the endpoint and the core is, the remote core is sending data. Here we are just like opening uh, the log file to see what's going on. So we are just opening, and we see the, a vector, right? For each line, um, we see a vector, three components that are the absolute values so of the norm of the vector of each vector. So we have three values because we have three vectors, we are calculating the norm. In the second uh, example here, we are launching the program with the raw data. And so here we see the raw data coming from the, um, the, three, the three devices. So, so here we are running in vector mode. You see the vector mode. We switch back. So we see here that uh, we have the accelerometer vector and we have three components. We have the magnetometer vector and we have three components and we have the gyroscope vector, so the um, angular velocity. 
vector that has three components. Okay, so let's switch back to the presentation. So this was the headless demo. And we we did this just to you know to make sure that everything was working properly with the right debugging tools. By the way, we use like a general, like a not special tool. We just use Eclipse uh, with some plugins for the the C developments, and uh, so no proprietary uh, platform to to develop the MCU code and debug the MCU code. Obviously, we use uh, Android Studio for the Android part. Okay, so uh, let's switch to the headful mode. So we decided that, okay, uh, everything was working properly, so let's build an Android app to show, to plot the data. Um, so there are different, uh, this app is, I don't know how you guys are, um, if you guys are um, Android developer or you have any knowledge on such domain, but uh, as any Java program, we just divided the application in packages. So we have four packages. The UI package that is just managing fragments, one for plotting the the, for plotting the two different um, uh, way we, we, we show data. One is the uh, norm plot fragment that just show the, the three values of the norm, of each norm, uh, of each, uh, norm of each vector. And uh, we have a vector plot fragment where we see all the raw components for each vector. Uh, very important, we have a device manager. Device manager is the core part because it's the, it's the Java is the Java package that is in charge to read data from the sensors using what is called the Java native interface. And we'll be talking a bit about this. So we are able from Java to open an endpoint device, close an endpoint device, and create an endpoint device because we exported to the Java domain also the possibility to create, to invoke an uh, IOC, uh, IO control command to create the endpoint. And then we have a um, math uh, package that is, um, you know, just the, the, what we needed to consume the, 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 serial, the serialized data coming from the, uh, from the sensor device. So just to consume those data and prepare those data to be shown in the UI. So what was important uh, to do in terms of, of, of Java application is, hey, how can I get into, the, into those low level layer uh, close to the kernel for handling the RP messages coming from the remote core? So Java, because, you know, guys, is a, um, like a multi-platform kind of uh, languages, there is no, uh, there is no way you can be very close to the hardware. So we need a sort of layer that is platform dependent because you, get, you have native code. You need a layer to, just to provide, you know, to map what is happening in the lowest level of the system to the Java layer. And so you are able to access those resources from your Java code. To do that, you have to do what is called native library so it's some C code that is uh, communicating to the low level uh, components with the system. And these native libraries have some methods and functions. And what you do is to expose those functions and declare their interface uh, to the Java code. So from the Java, you are able to include those, uh, those methods in your class. And those methods are binded to the low-level uh, native library functions. So, by the way, GNI is very extreme; is extremely used in the Android in the Android ecosystem. Um, so, these pictures show you a, a, a very important uh, component of every an Android phone that we have. Uh, that, that we, are, if you guys are using an Android phone, right? You have sensors. You have a lot of things that are close to the hardware. And there is a component that is called the abstraction, the uh, hardware abstraction layer. And those are, that hardware abstraction layer relies on a, a lot of native libraries that manufacturers wrote for you in order for the, uh, and they wrote also the interface to the, so the, the Android has this abstraction layer that 
expose those uh, like custom devices uh, to the uh, Android SDK and you as a developer you use the standard SDK to access a custom chip because someone that the someone else the manufacturer in particular he wrote the native library and interface those library using the HAL interface so that the, the, he wrote a, a sort of native code and, and bind this native code in a proper way, in a proper manner, in order for those uh, methods to be binded in, in the correct way and be uh, consumed by the Android SDK. So this is, is a, this, this is mechanism. This mechanism is, is is heavily used. So what we did is we create a native library for handling the endpoint creation, and uh, this this will was actually, this is a very simple example, but it was really crucial because we can open and close a character device from Java really easily, but there is no way we can invoke an input of control operation. So the endpoint creation required an IO CTL, and so uh, we had to build a native library to, uh, to, to call the IO CTL, and then we need to map that, um, that function uh, to the to the um, using the Java native interface, and so we would be we were able to use that function from the Java code. Uh, so this is uh, the uh, endpoint creation. So this code is just to show you, right? This is native code. So this is C, and uh, the the first so the first line, right? This function here um, open. The, um, the control device just with an open and this is the function that makes you know the magic of creating an endpoint so we are calling uh, an input output control uh, function and the and this is the um, the command that creates the endpoint so we need to use you know we need to map this function from the C to the Java in order to create the endpoint Uh, uh, so this is how the application looks like. So once we are able to create endpoints and send messages to the remote core, we can tell the remote core, hey, switch to vector mode, switch to norm mode, and start sending me data so I can plot the data. And so we have two different fragments, one that shows um, the, all the components of the vector uh, for each vector, and uh, on the bottom you see uh, just um, one value for each sensor that is the module, the norm of each uh, row vector that has uh, each row vector. So some numbers. Um, so we collect uh, samples every uh, 10 milliseconds. So we are going to 100 hertz. And um, what we do is to buffer 300 elements. Why this? Because we are using a TCM memory. So it's we are using just like a very fast caching uh, memory uh, instead of the entire shared memory. So it's possible to address big buffers, but you gotta use you, you gotta use the DDR. Um, so we just right now um, for this example, for this demo, using the the, the the TCM memory that is just 32 kilobytes. Um, so the, the number of bytes that we are handling are uh, 12 bytes in norm mode and 36 bytes in vector mode, obviously because we are dealing with three floats and it, each float is four bytes. Uh, so items are the queue and sent to the master uh, at time of uh, 10 milliseconds. So uh, some numbers in norm mode sending speed is one point. 32 kilobytes per second and in vector mode is 3.76 kilobytes per second. So this is a sort of throughput measurement, but again, on a limited number of data in a buffer that is just uh, three kilobytes. Yeah, so let's go to the second video. So here we just see, um, so here we are in, um, norm mode so we are receiving just three values from the uh, microcontroller and those three values are the um, norm of each vector coming from the sensor so we have three vectors so we have three uh, uh, three values that are plotted 
And uh, this is a very simple application that, that allows us to switch between the two modes. So here we are uh, looking at the norm. You can, you can, uh, and we see that we switch to raw. And uh, what we see here is for each sensor, right, we see the three components uh, plot. Um, so the code, we publish the code in our GitHub, so it's public. Um, and it's very, you know, the, the code actually required to, to, do, to do this app is not, it's not, nothing fancy. So this is the power of Android, right? So with Android, we can create those kind of interfaces pretty pretty easily and, and, and fast. And again, this is probably part of the motivation why we are using um, Android in, in embedded devices. Uh, there are other frameworks, obviously, like Qt for Linux. Uh, so um, it's just like, you know, how, 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 you, you, how fast you develop uh, uh, interfaces for your target for your target application. There's a you know tons of library in in, in modules in Android that allows you to deal with media and you know fancy interfaces and, and gestures. Also, this is a very important point. So the level of gesture handling, if you want to create multi-touch user experience, actually Android is pretty is pretty effective. Um, I want to show you the setup. I want to just show you guys the setup from a more uh, in a different angles. So you see the board. You see um, that we are moving the sensor. We are uh, again showing the norm mode. Uh, the sensor again is using the E2C. So we use the um, I, I think is the X16 uh, connector on the iris board, and we just uh, wired up the sensor to the to the board. Uh, E2C is used exclusively by ENSU in this case. Um, the rest is just like again the standard uh, iris setup and the off-the-shelf uh, touch uh, from Toradex. Okay, some technical references here. So if you go on our uh, technical note. Um, or there's like a mistake here, is slash docs. So http connectedscom slash docs. We have what we call the technical notes. And uh, we have different articles there on Android asymmetric multiprocessing, RP message driver, and also a detailed description of the demo that you guys saw on this presentation. The, the code of the application is available on our GitHub. Uh, that is GitHub slash Kinetics. Um, and it is also the Open AMP project page that is quite important uh, because it gives you like the entire, um, a lot of information about Open AMP. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite significant to, to, to specify that the R toss provided by Toradex. So you can download the R toss that we have used on this demo um, from Toradex directly and uh, that our toss includes the uh, RP message framework uh, that has been ported um, uh, from OpenAMP. So the, the entire toss system that we have used is off the shelf ready from, from Toradex. This is super sweet. Um, and also there is our presentation at the ELC 2018 uh, where we, uh, we, we didn't talk about Android specifically, but we talked as a, uh, um, it's an introductory talk about asymmetric multiprocessing and how we approach the, the, the development, so which tools we use, which version of the RTOS, how we deploy RTOS, how we, so uh, like a sort of guideline for, for um, from, from ground up, how to enable your platform, uh, your board to uh, run uh, asymmetric and heterogeneous code. Um, from scratch, so starting fresh. Yeah, thanks a lot for for this presentation, Nicola. Um, we already got some questions, so I will start with them because now everyone is still available. Um, and yes. one question is: um, You do this get buffer? How many? buffers are used in practice. So you talked two. about transmit and receive. So it's only this two. Yes, there's only two buffers. 
So this is a typical flow that is used in VirtiIO, even when you are using VirtiIO in virtualization um, situations. So every virtualization um, engine software that uses VirtiIO for part of virtualization is using this, this method, this way. So this is nothing more than what VirtiIO is already doing. What has been added to the uh, entire ecosystem, asymmetric multiprocessing ecosystem is the, this platform driver. So this platform driver is what creates in the VTIO bus a new type of device that is the RP message device. So this is what has been provided by uh, NXP. This is very important because it has all the magic from the hardware, so the, all the messaging unit implemented in hardware and allows those hardware to be interfaced to the VTIL bus. Okay, perfect, thanks. Um, then another question is, um, can you run bare metal on the M4 or is uh, RPOS required? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Uh, so this is a very good question. So the thing is, if you want to use RP message, so if it is a general question, like, hey, can you run uh, any code, bare metal code on M4? Yes. If you want to use bare metal that uh, does um, message sending between the two cores, so you want to leverage RP message, you got to take care of porting the OpenM framework inside your bare metal code. This is why I was specifying uh, a few minutes ago that if you download the RTOS from Toradex, the um, code artifacts for you to develop your application leveraging the RP message framework is already in there. So the RP message is already present in the free RTOS uh, that Toradex provides. If you want to go bare metal, so you want to get rid of RTOS, you got to take care of porting your, um, in your code the RP message uh, framework from scratch, obviously. Okay. Um, yeah, I think <laughs> this question is, is a little bit away, but um, someone asks, how much were you able to drop CPU utilization with RPMSG? But I think the idea wasn't to uh, reduce the, the CPU utilization. Is oh, yeah, important? no, 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 absolutely. But this is a good question, absolutely a good question, too. Um, I guess the uh, what we are trying to achieve here is uh, the third point of this slide. So what I want to do is just have a segregated, a separate process that doesn't depend on an operating system that is not real time, for example, or is uh, like um, um, because Android, you know, and, and the Linux in general, they are monolithic kernel based. They can actually hang the entire device if a kernel panic occurs because a driver hangs. So how can we separate the two th the two domains in order for critical system to run on on a core and the rich OS run on another core? And I'm able to handle some kind of critical situation in a more separated way, in a more segregated way. I don't want the, the two systems to influence each other, and I want the MCU to actually work independently from the OS, the rich OS, that it's just displaying the data, so that is, you, I don't want to in any way interfere with the critical tasks that are running on the MCU from my, um, from my, uh, visualization uh, application. Uh, it's very important, again, to, re to remember that the master core, so if you unpower, if you unpower the, 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 the master core, also the remote core will be unpowered. So one of the tricky situation is, okay, how can I reboot eventually the master core from a kernel panic and and, and, and at the same time, you know, just a soft reboot, not a hard reboot, a soft reboot in order for the MCU to continue to perform its tasks. This is what we actually uh, show, show uh, the embedded Linux conference. So we generate the kernel panic, we reboot the system, and the MCU was caching, saving in memory the, the data from the uh, IMU 
and the application was uh, able to display the missing data uh, that uh, the, the, the application lost because it was rebooting in the meantime. So this is the use case for this particular um, uh, setup. So it's not really to save time on the CPU, even because CPU are like pretty uh, powerful today. Okay. Um, then there is one question. So if, if the ARPOS wants to wake up Linux somehow, can is it possible that Linux can block with the select on a, on def RPMS G0, for example, and as soon as the ARPOS sends data, the, the Linux application will run again, so the event loop gets triggered? So uh, let's say, if I understood right, so let's say that we want to uh, make the Linux application to sleep or the Android OS to sleep, if I'm able to awake the, 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 the master core from the remote core? Is this the question? I think it's more meant that the event loop is triggered so that it's only, let's say, if you have, a, if you do a select on, on, on a dev RPM as G0, and then the art was sent some data that, that the, the application can send an event in this case. Okay, so the, so we, we are dealing with two different, uh, two different uh, things here. We have message, messages that goes from uh, the, the master to the remote or remote to master, and we have like general purpose interrupts, right? So the general purpose interrupts is what can, so, and they are issued by the, um, uh, by the, the master core, and uh, that can tell the, the remote, hey, start doing something, stop doing something. And there is also a third one that detect for any reason, if for any reason the master core has been um, shut, it, shut it down, it's, it's, it's like a, not working anymore. So if for some reason the master core is stuck, I, the, the remote core is notified about, about this because it's not responding anymore to a sort of heartbeat uh, that is requested by the remote core. This is the only type of signaling that I can issue between the, the two cores. Okay. Yep, I think that makes it clear. Um, then, um, that they are somehow related. Um, so someone asks if it is possible to create a virtual COM port between the master and the M4. And then someone else asks if that's the ping pong mechanism. I think that's an example we provide on, on, on the Toratex website, um, where we do a virtual COM port actually. But perhaps you know more about that. No, you mean a virtual, uh, like a virtual COM port? That's yeah, it's some, some kind of TTI def. Yes, this is a difference between what you guys did with the robot, I guess. Was the robot demo? Was the robot yeah, exactly. Yes. So in the robot demo, use the TTY, you use a different approach. Use a, like a terminal, um, use a TTY via TIO. Yeah, exactly. Here we are not using the TTY via TIO. Yep. And then I think one last question. If, if there are more questions, uh, we can still answer you per email or if you have questions that you don't ask yet, you can ask them on Toradex community forum. Um, the last question is, can the Toradex free actors work with Debian Linux? I think that's no problem at the end. Yeah, I don't think there is any, no, I don't think there is any problem. No, 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 no. Yeah. Uh, okay. Again, um, if we will be updating um, also code and, and how to on the Coesis BSP in our um, technical notes. So uh, just check like in, in the next in the next days the GitHub slash kinetics, uh, GitHub.com slash kinetics and the um, kinetics.com slash docs. Uh, for um, uh, updates on resources available 
in terms of code and in, and uh, and uh, binaries if you guys want to test this demo i don't know if it is something that you guys are interested to test this demo on your iris uh imx6 so c configuration but if you are we will be publishing all the resources to allow you to uh set up the demo uh using the toradex hardware that we have shown in this presentation perfect cool so thank you very much for, for presenting your, your work that you did it was interesting oh, thank you for having me and uh, again if you guys want more information or you want more uh, uh, some code snippet or something that may help you to just start doing something in this domain uh, if you go in our website there is a contact form just reference to the webinar or contact anyone in Toradex and we'll be super help, you know super ready to help you and happy to help you out to uh, explore this domain that is quite fascinating, but it can be, you know, <laughs> some kind of uh, headache generator <laughs> at the first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, if and if if we can answer so, any uh, something, we will redirect you to to Kinetic. Yes, uh, again, uh, Toradex is providing a lot of um, uh, good tutorial uh, on this space. Uh, this is very focused on what we have done so far in the Android space. Um, just to tell you a little bit more, uh, the next step about what we would be doing is, is it possible to actually extend the SDK of Android to deal with uh, asymmetric systems? So right now we did a native library that is, is compiled uh, inside the project and the application use this as a pure application extension to uh, to, to work. But uh, what if uh, all what is necessary from an application standpoint that is a, the, the complete API that you need to work with asymmetric system integrated in the Android layer? So uh, you, we can just release a version of the Coesis VSP that has an extension of the Java SDK that are ready to to, to interact with the low-level uh, requirement in terms of kernel to, to, to handle the messaging between the, the multiple cores. So this is where um, we are working on with customers. So it's, it's, it's okay having something just in, inside your application. So like in this slide, so we have the native library and this is just our app, right? And something different is having those integration that and from a from a system perspective, so down in the where system um, libraries, uh, Android native system library resides, and we can create an extension of the SDK to uh, interact with the uh, RP message in a more seamless way and and and, and standard way. So, okay, yeah, then perfect. So yeah. Thanks all of you for attending this webinar and hope you've learned something. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.